Massimo Piliucci. Hi, how are you, man? <laughs> good, good to see you. Um, uh, to our viewers, welcome to the Sophia program. Um, uh, I am Daniel Kaufman, professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, uh, and this is my good friend and partner. Who are Mas you? Yuchi, KD Irani, professor of philosophy at City College in New York. And Massimo is wrapping up his, uh, his time in Rome. That's right. And you, I understand, have uh, completed the, the draft of your book, so you're on schedule. I am on schedule, which is unbelievable. Actually, technically, I'm ahead of schedule. Uh, I gave myself four months to finish the first draft, and uh, it's done uh, with several weeks uh, in advance. So I'm, I'm very happy. And, so what's uh, the next? What happens next? Well, next, I'm going to go on vacation. <laughs> no, I meant <laughs> so with the book. I meant with the book. <laughs> I mean, the vacation is well deserved. Well, the book is going to stay there for a little bit, and then I'm going to go back to it at um, you know the end of July. And after that, uh, it's going to go to the publisher, which is Basic Books. Uh, the book, by the way, is is How to Be a Stoic, uh, and it's focused uh, mostly on uh, on the figure of Epictetus, which is the least known to the general public of the famous Stoics. I mean, the, you know, everybody knows Marcus Aurelius, everybody knows Seneca. Uh, Epictetus usually people haven't heard of, even though it was sort of crucial for the for the whole thing. So it's going to go to the publisher uh, in August, and they tell me that the production schedule will have it out by April of next year. And uh, this you're writing this in the format of a dialogue between is it between you and Epictetus? Yeah, it's not quite a dialogue; it's a conversation. So yeah, I quote him. Basically, the device is to quote him verbatim essentially from the mostly from the discourses uh and and then i sort of I interject my own comments and then from there so each chapter starts out like that with a little bit of, of fictional banter and back and forth forth and then i i go on and elaborate on what it is that uh, epictetus has said so uh, so you're dante and, you're dante and he's virgil leading you through exactly the... <laughs> <That's a> good... <laughs> Exactly. All right. That's the idea. And you're as good a writer as Dante, too, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, um, okay, so today we're going to do the second of what's going to be, as we said uh, last time, three dialogues on your book um, that you published. Not the new one. Not, not the, the new the one. one. <laughs> right. The one you just published online um, in serial format in your blog, um, Plato's Footnote. And you have since, I think we did the dialogue, released it in its entirety as one, you, you released right. it in, in installments, um, and then at the end you released the entire thing. Is it, is it downloadable as a single PDF? It's downloadable as a single PDF. Okay. That's right. Okay. Um, and so that's, that's, that's uh, handy for people who want to, you know, sort of download the whole thing and be able to jump around and look at different sections. Yep. Um, and, and the book is about uh, the nature of philosophy and specifically how how philosophy makes progress, the distinctive way in which philosophy makes progress. And you do think philosophy makes progress, and you think it does so in a distinctive way. Um, just to remind people from last, and, and, and we are going to talk about philosophy today. Last time we talked about everything except for philosophy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we had to set the stage. That's so. right. That's right. We had to sort of really get to understand what you mean by progress before we can start talking about it in a specific context. Um, just to remind everyone, the, the, there are two basic senses of progress that you, I mean, you, you go into more detail than that, but there are two rough notions of progress that actually are in keeping with the standard common usage that you find in the dictionary. One is this idea of um, getting closer and closer to an established goal, and right. the other is coming, uh, getting to a fuller state of completion of, of whatever state it is you're in. Um, yeah. And you wanted to say that... Um, uh, with respect to other other fields, that science makes progress in the first sense, and you you did stick strictly to the natural sciences. Yeah, um, you didn't. You, I asked you about the social sciences. You said you kind of left those out on purpose, just because they were a complicating factor, and you wanted this to be relatively um, clear cut, just for the sake of clarity. Yeah. And then you said logic and mathematics progress in the second sense of coming to a greater and greater state of completion, uh, given whatever state they're in. Um, now. It's not a mystery novel, so I'm going to give away the ending. Uh, your claim is that philosophy makes progress in the sense that uh, logic and mathematics do and not in the sense that uh, natural sciences do. 
and right. that's what we're gonna that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, the the fact that the, the way why you think philosophy makes progress um, uh, uh, in this manner rather than in the manner of the natural sciences. Um, before we get to that, though, one thing I do want to ask you because it is something you addressed in the book, albeit quite briefly. Um, you you do you do you are of the view that philosophy makes progress and. Someone surveying the scene could come to a, a different conclusion. Could come to the conclusion, sure. of and, and one of those people, I think, um, it's fair to say, uh, was Wittgenstein. Uh, yes. and, and indeed, indeed, this is a good part of the point of his later philosophy. Um, he, he thinks he thinks that philo philosophy is a kind of therapy that allows right. you to cure you of philosophy. Right. <laughs> um, he talks about you know compares it to climbing up a ladder and kicking the ladder away, um, and so. Let me just, if you don't mind, give a tiny, very brief sketch of why you might think this in the way that Wittgenstein says it, so that you can then explain why, despite that, you think philosophy makes progress anyway. Okay. Sounds like a, like a deal. In the meantime, I'll drink my wine. Yeah, um, I'll drink coffee. <laughs> if I drink wine, it's 11.30. If I drink wine now, people are going to look at me funny. That's uh, the difference. That's the difference. So... One of the reasons why people in general are tempted to say philosophy doesn't make progress is because when you look at philosophical problems, they seem to be perennial. Um, yeah. And so, you know, your your blog is called Plato's Footnote, which of course goes to a famous quote by Albert, Albert North Whitehead that, where he said, all the history of philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. And there right. is a sense in which we're say, asking the same questions that we were asking in ancient Greece, that we were asking in the Middle Ages, that we were asking the Enlightenment. Um right. And so one can get the... But, but, yes, go but, ahead. Sorry, before you go ahead, so, so yeah, that is true. But that actually, I think, before we, we, we even get to Wittgenstein, that's actually an objection that is somewhat easy to uh, dispatch uh, because that is true, I think, in any field, including the sciences, if you just define your questions broadly enough. I mean, after all, biology is still after the origin and diversification of, of living organisms, just like it was in Aristotle's time right. and certainly Darwin's time. And physics is still after, you know, the origin of the universe and the structure of the cosmos, just as it was in, uh, in, in Aristotle's right. time. So, and so, still yeah, doesn't it, have a final answer to those things. So you could say it's right. in the same boat as... as right, uh, right, right, right. right. So, so if, I, one bring, if one zooms back enough that the question becomes so broad, then yeah, sure, it's true that the philosophy is still going after the same questions, but so is, is essentially everybody else. <laughs> right, right. Okay, fair enough. And I mean, I mean, I guess I would have to, if I really wanted to be careful and rigorous about this, sort of phrase this uh, more carefully. Um, and this probably will get into areas that, that, that you and I are going to disagree on with regard to your, 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 uh, to regard to your um, a book. And so um, the idea, I guess, sort of is that we don't see the kind of forward momentum with respect to these questions that we see in the sciences. You right. know, the sciences of Newton's day are in a far more advanced state than the sciences of ancient Greece and the sciences of today are in a far more advanced. So, you know, you can see the sense in which we're getting somewhere. In philosophy, though, one could easily think that you're sort of going kind of uh, circles, maybe not the same circle over in time, but circles that sort of wander around a sort of a map. Um, right. And... Um, but but then again, you, you yourself pointed out in the beginning, just a few minutes ago, that, that there are at least those two different senses of, of the term progress, of the concept of progress. Right, right. And since I have, in fact, stated from the beginning, well, not from the beginning, from the middle of the book, that, that philosophy does not make progress in the way in which science does. That is, it doesn't proceed toward a, an ultimate goal, whatever that goal is, you know, a theory of everything, whatever, right, right, right. Or overarching theory of biological evolution, whatever it is. Since philosophy does not make progress in that way, then it's not surprising that, sure, science right. and philosophy work different ways, and, and the, 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 con the way in which they make progress, if they do, it ought to be different. Than right. So your move, I mean, your move, your, the, 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 the reason, the way in which you reject Wittgenstein, you say, look, um, I don't have to go to this drastic conclusion that you go to, that philosophy doesn't make any progress, because you're looking for the wrong kind of progress. Um, right. um, um, it progresses in this other way. But just for the sake of completion, let me just sort of say, so the, so the people who, who did have reason to be skeptical about philosophy, prior, people like Wittgenstein said, said something like this, you know, one of, the, one of the ways you know that something is amiss is when you keep bashing on the same thing and don't get anywhere, right? Sure. And so 
one of the things you might conclude is, hmm, maybe this isn't the pro the kind of problem that I thought it was. In other words, in other words, so something like the, you know the mind body problem, right? It's a sort of a perennial difficulty. I think that's one where we really still are not in much of a better position than we were than we were before in terms of the fundamental sort of metaphysics. We still don't know how how matter has subjective properties, right? right. Um, um, and we don't even know really what it means. Regardless, to... regardless of what the latest neurobiologists would tell you. We or David don't... Chalmers, right? Um, oh, um, yeah. <laughs> or Dan Dennett. Um, um, we really still don't know that or even understand really what it means to say that. So one of the things you might be tempted to say is, well, maybe it's not the kind of problem that we thought it was. We thought it was, we, we thought that the mind body problem was a problem sort of like, well, what's the relationship between your circulatory system and your uh, muscle system or between your, 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 you know what I'm saying? In other words, it looks like a, a, it looks like a very straightforward uh, problem of trying to find a relationship between two relata, but maybe it's not that kind of problem at all. Maybe mind isn't a thing in the way body is. Right. And, and so, and so, but I agree. Right. And so, but, and so one, of the, one of the things that you might conclude is, uh, and, and I don't want to go into detail, but this is sort of the generality is when you see a problem that you keep bashing your head on and can't seem to solve, um, one of the ways, that, one of the things you might conclude is that it's not really the kind of problem you thought it was. <clears throat> Correct. But now it's interesting because I tell my students, uh, in you know, in introductory classes, that that's, that is the hallmark of a philosophical problem as opposed to a scientific one. That is, uh, if you see that sort of situation you have you, you've been describing, it seems to me that that is not the kind of problem that can be solved empirically, or at least cannot be solved right now at the moment empirically. Um, and I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, you know, forget the, the mind-body problem, it's, it's, it's much more difficult. But a very simple one is the concept of species uh, in, in biology. Mm -hmm. So biologists over the, over the decades have come up with something like a couple of dozen of different concepts of species, or what a biological species is. And it's pretty clear at this point, after, you know, decades and decades and decades of debate, that this isn't a empirical question. It's not that somebody's going to do an experiment or collect yet more observations about biological species and say, aha, this is what they are. It's a conceptual problem. It's, it's a problem of conceptual clarification. And therefore, in my mind, it's a philosophical problem. Now, you mean, you mean, philosophical you, you, problem... Just, wait, wait, just yeah. to be clear, I understand you. In other words, we shouldn't think of species as actual sort of things. Right. What we're doing is working out what are the best taxonomies. Is that the best way of taxonomizing? So is it a linguistic problem, essentially? Um, not, not exactly. It's not just a linguistic problem. I mean, certainly language gets into it, you know, I mean, I hate it when people say, oh, but that's just semantics, as if semantics were not important. How we distinguish classes and things like that, or, or, or... So, the question is this. Biologists have often, have been after, you know, the question of what is a biological species? So, what, what kind of, we would say, what kind of ontological status, uh, do we attach to biological species? And... Uh, it is clear that that kind of answer, because biologists themselves have failed over many decades to answer that question, it's clear that there is no answer of that sort. Mm -hmm. There are different ways. What it is is that there are different ways of thinking about biological species. Those ways are certainly empirically constrained, because it's not that you can make up any any thing that you like, because you know we're talking about biological species. We're not talking about hypothetical entities, right? So there. So the answers, the ways of thinking about biological species are certainly uh, sorry, uh, empirically constrained, but they are really frameworks. There's a number of different frameworks that may uh, be applicable depending on which particular problem the biologist has. So the taxonomist or the systematist may have one conception of species. The paleontologist is going to have a different one. The uh, population geneticist may, be, may have a different one. And there is really no sense in asking the question, well, which one is right? Which one is the concept of species, because in fact, as it turns out, you can think of biological species in a number of coherent ways that are more or less useful depending on what you want to do with that concept. But that does almost sound like a Wittgensteinian solution to a yes. problem, right? I yes. mean, what you're essentially saying is that this is an issue of frame, a framework problem rather than a problem of, of, of how the world is actually carved up or, I mean, do they, right. I mean, are there 
species realists who think that, in a sense, this, that, that these groupings are actually in nature, or do they all adopt some sort of conventionalism with oh, that's a, to... that's, great, that's a great question. No, I think actually that most biologists are species realists. Uh, they're not essentialists. You know, they, they don't think there's an essence to, be, to being a particular species. Uh, but they are realists. And ironically, by the way, uh, Darwin himself was not a realist. Yeah, I wouldn't think clear. I wouldn't think so just from no, the logic right. of the that's right but that, I mean Darwin clearly said that because the, the process of evolution is a, is a gradual process then you would expect yeah. that they're not, not they're not going to be sharp boundaries between different species and you know we draw the boundaries as Wittgenstein would say because we have a particular purpose you know for convenience sake but it's not like those boundaries are actually out there yeah um, you know so in that sense yes it is a Wittgensteinian problem in fact Funny thing is, we, we, we can uh, uh, link the article, uh, but a number of years ago, I published a paper in Bioessays, which is a journal, a biology journal, entitled The, the Dissolution of the, of the Species Problem, mm. where in fact, I actually propose that it is that species are big and uh, uh, concepts. Family and resemblance, the, family resemblance categories. Yeah. Um, so one last this thing on, 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 on this question of making the move, the perception of lack of movement to making the move to this is not some of the sort of thing in which you make progress. It's a different kind of thing. Um, so in this, t in this regard, since you don't think this move is legitimate in philosophy, you think there's a distinctive way in which philosophy makes progress, progress. In this sense, also, I guess you depart from Hume, right? Because Hume wants to say, Hume and Kant have this wonderful opposite um, attitude towards skepticism, right? So yeah. Kant thinks that skepticism is where philosophy begins, right? Right. right. Um, Hume thinks it's where it ends. Right. Yes. Once you right. hit the skeptical problem, you've hit the bounds of human reason, and yes. after that, the accounts have to be naturalistic. Right. After 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 you hit the skeptical wall, from then on, the accounts you give of what we do and what we believe are naturalistic accounts in terms of the passions. Right. Uh, sort of but that, that's a so, so you disagree with Hume on that, right? You think that these I problems do. are real problems that can. Well, all right. Let me think about it because that's that's an interesting way to put it. Um, Yes and no. In this, in, in in terms, of, I mean, you're you're absolutely right. That is that is what Hume would say. I'm not so sure that I disagree as much as I I have a slightly different take uh, than Hume than Hume's on this issue. So I actually do think that skepticism is the arriving point, the terminal point of, of philosophical inquiry. So in that sense, I agree with Hume, and I think that two things can happen after that point. Either uh, one goes the full human way, as you as you just said. Basically, this becomes you know the only way to make far, further progress is that it has to become a problem in natural science, or and this is one of the things that I articulate in the in the latter part of the book, or in fact there is no such a thing as a final answer. What we have is either we have reached a limit of human understanding itself. So there's there's you know that's it. This is the best we can do about thinking about this sort of stuff. I am in that. That also is very human, right? I mean, let's not forget one of his books, major books, is the you know an, uh, an inquiry into natural, uh, you know, human understanding. Yeah. And um, or uh, there we reach the point. We reach a point on a particular problem where there isn't going to be an answer, a final answer, simply because what we get in the end is three or four or five or different frameworks, ways of thinking about it, and there is no fact of the matter which one is better or not. So if we, you know, when, when we're going to get to the examples of philosophical progress, uh, when I say in the book that in ethics, for instance, you know, utilitarians, uh, Kantian deontologists, virtue ethicists, and a few others, each one of them occupies a distinct peak or, or, or sort of land in, in the landscape of ethical frameworks. And to me, it makes no sense to say, yeah, but who is right? The virtue ethicist or the deontologist or the utilitarian? That, that question makes no sense. It is not a question that can be answered empirically. I mean, how, how would you go about doing right. that? Obviously not. It is not also a question that can be ans answered philosophically in the sense that there is no better way of doing it. It depends on what you want to do. Th those are available frameworks. And you can think of ethics in a utilitarian perspective and certain things follow if you do that. And other things will not follow. Or you can think of ethics in a virtual ethical uh, you know, framework and certain things will follow, other things will not follow. And you just have to make a decision based on how much that way of looking at things resonates with you as, a human, as an individual human being. And nobody can tell you, no, you're wrong about it. 
What they can tell you you're wrong about it is if you drew inferences, if, if you think that utilitarianism, let's say, entails certain things, right? And somebody says, well, actually it doesn't. And here's why it doesn't then yes, on that particular thing, you can be wrong. You can be wrong on what you derive from certain frameworks as either entailed or not. But on the framework itself, there's, there's no way. You just, yeah. It's, it's yeah. there. It's just yeah. there. Right. And I don't want to get things confused by, by pushing you on these things now because we are going to get to, to, right. to this at the end, to, towards the end. You're gonna, I want to ask you to give me your, your, your top five greatest hits of examples of progress in philosophy. Right. Um, um, so let's sort of – just the last thing on Hume. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is you do think that some philosophical problems are going to turn out in the way that Wittgenstein says. And they're going to turn out to be problems in which there really can't be progress because we misunderstand the kind of problems they are. Um, sure. You just don't think all of them are like that or that even That's most of them are like that. And so right. with Hume, in some places you're going to agree this is where we have to stop doing philosophy – uh, but in other places, you're going to say, no, we can keep doing philosophy, but don't expect a certain kind of outcome, right? I mean, don't, don't, don't yeah. expect a kind of a, a, a kind of a winner, winner takes all kind of outcome is what, what you're... What exactly. You're okay. So if to summarize, I guess, I guess I am perfectly fine um, being a pluralist here Yeah. Um, and saying that philosophical inquiry will lead down at least one of three different roads. Either we're going to show that the problem was actually... Can actually be dissolved. Right. That's the Wittgensteinian yeah. way, right? So this is we clarify things and then the problem basically disappears. Yeah. Because it turns out, as you were saying earlier, you know, maybe it turns out that the mind is not a thing, it's something different, and right. therefore the entire problem just goes up, disappears or, or turns into something else. Right. That's number one. The second possibility is as happened repeatedly in the history of philosophy, which which is at some point you reach the point where in fact you can spin off the entire question or the entire field to an empirically based discipline. You know, that's how science came about. That's how physics came about. That's how biology came about, psychology, and so on and so forth. And if that's the case, then it ceases to be a philosophical problem because now it, it, it's, it has evolved into an empirical problem, therefore a problem for natural sciences. And then the third view, the third possibility is that uh, the solution is the, to map this landscape of coherent positions or frameworks that are useful to think about, that may be deployed for specific problems, but among which there is no question of either one is being true or the other one false. But which amongst them, there, there exists a certain degree of indeterminacy in terms of, of, of um, that no further, that there no further amount of, of, of working at the problem is going to resolve. Right. Okay. Um, um, that's, that's all very interesting. And I, I actually just, while you were saying that, thinking of other things maybe to throw at you. Um, 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 okay, so let's talk, why don't you explain to us why you think philosophy, um, to the extent that it makes progress, does so in the manner, the second manner, that is of coming to a, a fuller and fuller state of completion from a, from a, from a uh, existing state. And thus progresses like mathematics and logic does, rather than um, progress in the manner of the natural scientists. Maybe you could lay out the, the, the key points of your argument there. Yeah. So I should sort of slightly rephrase what you just said. So in sure. my mind, philosophy does make progress more like uh, the way in which mathematics and logic do, and less like the way in which science does. See, you're always, actually, so, you're always so damn subtle, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to make everything very, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, and this is actually a crucial point because it cannot, it, it can definitely be misunderstood. I'm not claiming that philosophy is like, just like mathematics or logic, and I'm also not claiming that philosophy is entirely different from, from the empirical sciences. And the reason for this is very, is very simple, actually. So why am I claiming that philosophy has a lot of commonalities with mathematics and science? Be uh, and sorry, logic. mathematics and logic. Because philosophy is about conceptual issues. So, it, you know, you, you do it from an armchair, right? You don't, you don't go out uh, and do experiments. I mean, you can do experimental philosophy, but if you, if you read Melita's blog about uh, that sort of stuff, you know what I think about it. And um, <laughs> so let's set that aside for, for a minute, right? So... Philosophers don't do experiments. Philosophers don't, don't, don't do observations in the systematic, you right. know, empirical sense of, of the terms, you know, scientific sense of the terms. So in that sense, 
Therefore, it is a kind of conceptual activity. And the philosopher looks a lot like the mathematician or that, like the logician when he's at work, right? When, I, when I'm in my office, <coughs> having been both a philosopher and a scientist, I can assure you that if you took two snapshots, you know, of Massimo, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, in, a labor in my laboratory with, you know, doing ecology and evolutionary biology, it will look very different. You would just look at it and say, oh, that guy is a scientist. That other one, well, I don't know. Well, you had this big guy. hairy beard, actually, I think, you, right? That's right. <laughs> yeah. You definitely which is, sort of, <laughs> which is sort of ironic because it's the philosophers who are supposed to have right, right. You know, at least classically. You mean the activities so, would look different, not that you would look different. Is exactly. Right. <laughs> well, I look different because I'm a little older, but you know. Yeah. Um, but the activities will look different. Yeah. And, in, and yeah. of course, sure enough, I mean, one of the one of the reasons I'm going to open a, a small parenthesis here. One of the reasons it more than bothers me, kind of uh, puzzles me, how. So many people, including a lot of scientists, uh, think that, that there is no difference, and philosophers actually, think that there is no difference in kind between philosophy and science. Like, you know, oh, they're kind of the same thing, only science does it better. You know, something like that, right? An extremely naturalistically oriented philosopher would say that. You know, an Alex Rosenberg, for instance, would yeah. say that for sure. Uh, and of course, there's plenty of scientists who say the same Krauss, thing. Kraus has said that to you in exactly. that, that panel you did with Dennett and Kraus. Um, right. He said something like that to you. Right. Yeah. And and my response is, well, you guys have never actually either seen a scientist <laughs> and a philosopher, you know, at work in their natural habitats, or you had never read a paper. Because if you read a philosophy paper, it is completely nothing different. like a science paper. Nothing like a science paper. Zero. There's there's no 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 course. On the other hand. You look at a paper in logic, and now it begins to look a lot like a paper in philosophy. Logic, uh, logic papers, of course, have a lot more symbolism, uh, but there's a lot of, uh, of um, similarities there because they're both based on, on sort of exploring conce a conceptual problem. Uh, 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 conceptual uh, relations, yeah. yeah. Conceptual yeah. relations, you know, they, they can be more or less formal. Now, mathematics being close itself to logic, of course, a mathematic paper, mathematics paper doesn't look much like, very much like a philosophy paper, but the, very, but the logic underlying it is very similar. That is, you try to, you come up with, you start with certain conditions, certain axioms, certain situations, and then you try to figure out what those in, entail from a logical perspective. You're going to go in a certain direction because that direction is, you think, entailed by the premises you start with. I mean, is, so is, that, is, is it a, could it be as simply put as, there is just that 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 deduction occupy is, is by far the much is by far the most dominant modality in all three subjects. Whereas while deduction is used in the natural sciences, it's 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 far behind induction in terms of is, is that yeah. could you could you characterize the difference that way? I I think that you can characterize it that way. That only gets to part of the issue. But yes, that's a good way. I would say the ratio between deduction and induction is very different. Because, you know, even mathematicians these days do a lot of induction. I mean, they, you know, they when a problem is too yes, complicated yes, to, of course. To, to come up with a formal proof of something, they use computers to crunch numbers. Yeah. You know, that, that's an induction. Yeah, there's method. such a thing as mathematical induction, right? Right, right. Exactly. But that said, yes, I think the ratio between induction and deduction is, is different. Now, then, then why is it, in my mind, however, that philosophy is not just like mathematics and especially logic? Of course... I could cheat. When I, when I started out the book, the temptation to cheat was very um, strong because I could simply say, look, logic is a branch of, math of, of philosophy. Logic definitely and unquestionably has made progress over the last several centuries. I don't, and nobody disagrees with that sort of statement. Yeah. So therefore, philosophy itself makes progress. But that would be too easy. I, I separated logic from philosophy, not because I think that there is a, a fundamental difference there, but because it serves my purpose of, of highlighting both the similarities between philosophy and sort of deductive uh, activities on the one hand, but also with the inductive activities. Why am I saying that philosophy is somewhere along that continuum between mathematics and logic on one hand and empirical sciences on the other hand? Because philosophers, by and large, except for logicians, are interested in real life problems. You know, if, if, we, if we're talking ethics, right, we're talking right, right, about right, right. behavior, right? Pro-social human behavior. Yeah. If we're talking philosophy of mind, we're talking the human brain and how it interacts with its environment. Right. If we're talking metaphysics, we're talking about often 
the way in which the, the cosmos hang together, you know, what, what, is, what is it all made of and, you know, where does yeah. it come from? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. All of those questions have an underpinning or a component of empiricism. Right. They, they must. Right. So what I'm proposing, therefore, is that philosophy sort of hangs in between. It's concerned with empirically grounded questions but the kind of empirically grounded questions that admit of more than one potential framework. And they are certainly, and here's, I think, one, one of my favorite ways of putting it is, the kinds of questions that philosophy is interested in are not just underdetermined by the empirical evidence, but massively underdetermined by the empirical evidence. That is, it's clear to me that, let's say, if we're doing ethics, right, I think that empirical evidence is relevant in some sense. Like, for instance, I'm a virtuoticist, as, as our viewers know. So I'm interested in human flourishing and well-being and all that. Well, I do need some kind of grounding of, you know, what kind of biological beings human being, humans are. You know, what, what Aristotle is. grounds it straightforwardly in a human anthropology. I mean, I right, mean, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So you have to have yeah. some idea from anthropology, yeah. or even if you will, from evolutionary biology, from psychology for sure, mm -hmm. of what sort of things yeah. make or doesn't make... Uh, you know, even you know, defining yeah. flourishing, what counts as flourishing? I mean, right. flourishing is a, is, a, is, a, is a notion that presupposes some conception of, of what the subject is. And so sure. to even say what counts as human flourishing, you at least have to look at biology or psychology or something exactly. that anchors you exactly. into the actual human being. Yes, yes. Exactly. What I don't believe, unlike, let's say, Quine, what I don't believe is that once you go into that direction, you go all the way, and therefore you can turn over ethics to the psychologist and you're done with it, or you can turn epistemology to the psychologist and we're done with it. Those are, that's the kind of naturalism that Quine started out, uh, well, actually Hume started out, really, although he didn't go that far. He did not go Quine, as far as Quine, no, no. No, definitely not. Quine really got, got it to the extreme, and these days, you know, contemporary, uh, some contemporary philosophers go that way, much further that way, as, again, Alex Rosenberg probably is the best example. Um, no, I don't go that far, but I do think that these kinds of problems are, in fact, ought to be informed by empirical evidence. And, and look, philosophers themselves realize that, because... When we, when we go to a philosophy meeting or we write a philosophy paper, right, often what do we do? We say things like, well, it's common intuition that. Or uh, imagine this case in which, you know, uh, this guy is looking at this situation and so on and so forth. In other words, we always try to bring it down to uh, real world examples, right? Yeah. And, and that's, to me, that's empirical. I mean, it's, you know, well... Is it the case that, you know, most people think that? And so those are, those are questions that are grounded in empirical evidence, but they're not determined by yeah. empirical evidence. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, one thing I was going to say was that it really isn't even only massively underdetermined. It's really indeterminate because yeah. to suggest that it's underdetermined is simply to suggest that if one did accumulate enough empirical evidence, we would just have one theory of flourishing. And I don't see that that would ever be the case, right? You're right. Um, You're right. Um, um, uh, it seems to me that they're indeterminate. And there's an interesting, that's an interesting landscape to sort of to explore. Let me ask you this. And if you, if, you can't, if you can't answer this, I don't want to answer it on the fly. That's fine. But what is the value of having multiple accounts where the accounts are indeterminate? Oh, that's an excellent question. Uh, no, no, I, it, I, I think I have an answer. At least I, I thought about it for, for, uh, for, for a while while writing the book because that is an actual, actually an excellent uh, question because you, you do have to answer that question. Otherwise, you say, well, don't, so, so what are you doing this What's course? so great about having this proliferation of theories, yeah, exactly. even if you have more of them, right? right. If, um, 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 if, uh, if, they're, if they're not the kinds of theories that are competing with each other in any clear sense, Right. Well, they are competing, but in, a, but in a sense that it's not the empirical one. So let me go back to ethics, because it's, it, I think it's easier to see with ethics than with other branches. Although, as you know, in, in the book, uh, on the, in, the, in the chapter on progress in philosophy, I actually go in great detail on the, in epistemology. In yes, I, and I want to talk about some of those examples. Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. So at some point, we might talk about that, but there's a really complex concept map there that, that sort of tries to track a bunch of different alternatives in, in the discussion of, on, the, on the concept of knowledge. But I think it's easier to understand at least the first, ra first round uh, if we're talking about ethics. So there are two reasons why you may want to uh, 
uh, develop these alternative frameworks in, in ethics, even though they are indeterminate, as you put it. Uh, with respect to the evidence. With, yeah. with respect to the evidence. There is some disconnect between the evidence and the, and the frameworks. So, um, and, and those are two. First of all, in order to um, arrive at a good description, a good elaboration of these, which I call, uh, you know, peaks in intellectual lens in an intellectual landscape or in a conceptual landscape. Let's say again, utilitarianism being one, Kantian deontology another one, virtue ethics and so on and so forth. And car- uh, uh, ethics of care could be a fourth one and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Right. In order to arrive that, first of all, you have to eliminate a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. That it's incoherent or less coherent or not interesting or not. Or so, or so separate, decoupled from actual human experience or actual human needs that it's not. It wouldn't be a good framework from ethic, for ethics. Like, and there, and we do have cases like this. So extreme uh, versions of uh, socialism, for instance. Okay, they don't work. I mean, I, I, it, and they don't work for a simple, for a, for a good reason because human beings, biologically speaking, they're, they're not social insects. They, so you think they, we can positively rule out some? So, so that picture of indeterminacy is a little more complicated than that. You actually think that we can categorically reject some ethical theories or political theories or whatever on the grounds that they're disconfirmed by the evidence. Well, on the grounds that either they are incoherent, uh, obviously, so that for conceptually they, they're just full of holes that are that are then hold up to scrutiny. Or, yes, because they, they fly in the face of some kind of important feature of whatever the problem is. Of human nature about which there is massive and widespread agreement? Is that the idea? Well, again, there's, there's no widespread agreement about human nature. In fact, if you ask a bunch of biologists and a bunch of philosophers, they'll give you very different answers yeah. about they, human nature, right? But I think we all agree, including the biology, in fact, for most of the biologists, that Yes, human beings are social animals, but they're social animals of a particular kind. There are different examples in nature of social animals. And we are nothing like, uh, you know, social insects. Yeah. We don't have that kind of structure. We don't have that kind of interaction in our societies, which means that if you propose a political or ethical system that is essentially a human version... That's one that's suited for insects, right. It's not going to work for us. Work. But I wonder if that's the re- reason for that is the, that's the degree to which, to a certain extent, those kinds of theories are in part empirical theories. They're, claim- they're making empirical claims. But like, I'm trying to think of the most far-out radical moral theories. Um, so let's say something like Nietzsche's, right? Um, yeah. so, or some sort of a hard egoism. Um, I don't see how you could rule those out in the, uh, on the basis of Phyllis, on the basis of the evidence. You know, what I'm no, saying? you don't. You don't rule them out on the basis of the evidence. But what you do is, but again, so so the evidence does hardly uh, rule out philosophical theories or philosoph- I prefer to use the word account, as you know. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, yeah. The word theory should best best be you left for science. Theory. Yeah, yeah. So. No, I don't think that empirical evidence necessarily rules out entirely, you know, sort of out of uh, from from the beginning, from the get-go, uh, a certain number, uh, a certain kinds of, of philosophical accounts. But what it does is that some of these accounts work better than others. Some of these accounts are more convincing than others, right? So it all, I mean, philosophy is a human activity, concerns mostly, although not exclusively, with the human being and how it navigates the world and how it understands the world. Even metaphysics, which it's probably the, the further that you can go from the direct concern of human beings. It's really about human understanding of the cosmos. Yes. More than, yeah. know, of the universe, right? So, which means that we always have to come back to, yes, but does that make sense to me as a particular type of biological being with certain characteristics, brain activities, social structures, and so on and so forth, and cultural history, etc., etc., etc. And what I maintain is that, that there are some ethical accounts uh, like Kantianism, the ontology, uh, sorry, uh, utilitarianism and so on, that do make sense. They, they, you can make them work because they are sufficiently coherent. I mean, they have problems, of course, and which is why you know, the, the Kantian deontologist would, would point out the holes in the utilitarian right. landscape the, and vice versa, right? They tend to have complementary problems and virtues is what they tend to have, right? The cases right. that the utilitarian gets wrong, the Kantian typically gets right. And, and, and vice versa, yeah, correct. Yeah. yeah. So, but and then and then it's good that each other points out 
these issues because then they force the other side to sort of refine things and say, okay, well, how can I deal with this, with this issue? But they tend to be overall fairly highly coherent uh, from a conceptual perspective frameworks. And then they may be convincing enough to a good number of human beings that, that people actually use them in their everyday life. You know, there's a lot of people, there's, there's psychological evidence that a lot of us uh, go around and act essentially as utilitarians. Not all of us, for sure, but a good number of people do act actually. Well, we as all as probably do in certain circumstances, right? I mean, yeah. in other words, the way I always tell it to my students is that the reason why you have what seem to be incommensurable moral theories is that we have incommensurable moral intuitions, right? Right. And, and, and so, you know... It, 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 it's fitting that the theories, the accounts would be um, somewhat heterogeneous and incommensurable because the base intuitions that they come from are heterogeneous and incommensurable. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. And I think that it would be a good, a good thing if not only philosophers, but also people outside of philosophy, especially the science, scientists who are critical of philosophy, would just get the hell out of this attitude that just like in science, there has to be a single answer, right? right. So if you, if you go into science and you say, well, here's the biological, you know, here's the Darwinian theory of evolution, here's the Lamarckian theory of evolution, those are just frameworks. You can think of them as you like. A scientist will look at you and say, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. It's either one or the other is right, or in fact, they may bo bo both possibly be wrong, but it's certainly not the case that they're go both going to be right. Yeah. That is not the case in philosophy. In philosophy, precisely because of what you say, philosophy is about human understanding of certain things, and humans can reasonably disagree and reasonably understand things right. differently. And so that there isn't going to be a, a situation where you say, oh, no, you are clearly wrong about this. Right, 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 right. Um, no, that's really interesting, and that, that gets us, that's going to get us into things that I, that I really want to ask you um, about this notion of progress. Um, but again, I don't want to. I don't want to get everything confused. So I'm going to try and stick stick to the script. Um, so, to summarize, if you could give a relatively simple formula, why is it valuable to have multiple philosophical accounts of a single topic, which are mutually incommensurable, not incommensurable, which which uh, amongst which they are indeterminate with respect to the evidence or the right. arguments. Um, what, what would be your pithiest way of sort of saying what the value of that is, of having more of these rather than... So the value of that would be that um, since there is no uh, clear winner, clear, clear one answer, you know, one way of doing things, there's more than one reasonable way of looking at things, if you are inclined uh, to look at things, let's say, as a utilitarian, right? If, if your personal inclination is, you know, for whatever reason, it resonates better, uh, the, the utilitarian intuition resonates better with you, then you may also be want to be aware of two things. First of all, that there are in fact problems with utilitarianism, problems of coherence of, a, of the account. So you don't want to just go around and say, well, I behave like an utilitarian. Yes, you do. But what do you do in those cases, which the other side has pointed out, uh, are problematic for your, for your account? And that may be helpful actually in practice, because even though I may be a, broadly speaking, a utilitarian, I might actually st stop and say, oh, right, however, there are these issues that I don't know to, how to deal with. There are these other accounts that are interesting. That's so, one so, so you may become a better practitioner in the sense right. of because you're able to recognize that there are other kinds of reasons that may exactly. be relevant. And is this something, that, let me ask you, is this something you think you could generalize? In other words, this value of having multiple accounts which are to a certain extent incommensurable, or at least um, that th can't be settled by the evidence or arguments. Um, could you generalize this? Could you say a similar story about why it's valuable to have several different accounts of epistemic justification, right? To, uh, yeah. ha to have a causal yeah. theory like Goldman's or to have a modified um, um, traditional theory like Lehrer and Paxson's, uh, yeah. et cetera. Could you give a similar, is there a similar story you can tell across the disciplines yes. in philosophy? I, I, think, I think there is. And uh, in fact, that, that can be a, a, a really nice sort of common thread among different discussions or different areas of philosophy. That is, um, all of these different accounts do two things. Uh, as I said, the first one is to make you aware of the fact that your preferred account, whatever it happens to be, uh, actually has problems. It's not perfect. No, none of these accounts is 
so much better than any of the others. That's right. That a reasonable person would say, ah, oh, yeah, that's got to That's be why it. you have very smart people occupying virtually right. every position on the conceptual map. Correct. Right. Well, almost. You have very smart people occupying a small number of positions, I would argue. You, the reason you don't see a bunch of other positions is because they've been eliminated. Or, right. You know, I mean, but I mean, among the positions there are, you've got yeah. very smart people in every single one, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, there are smart idealists, right? I mean, there are very, right. there, yeah. you know, there are smart mathematical Platonists, there are smart mathematical nominalists, there are smart causal, you know, causal theories of justice. Yeah, you can't find any of these positions that some very smart people don't take. That's um, right. Which is but that's interesting. number one. That's reason number one. Reason number two is that occasionally, I mean, it has happened to me personally, for instance, in the case of ethics, but occasionally you start thinking about this stuff, you look at, you know, the objections and the counter objections, and then you switch side. You say, you know what? As it turns out, I started out as, I thought that utilitarianism was, yeah. a consequentialism was a reasonable position or the position most clicked with me, but now... As it turns out, often listening and reading and all that sort of stuff, it turns out actually virtual ethics is. Right? Yeah, that happened to me. I, I'm a, right. I, my positions today are unrecognizable compared to the ones I held while I was in graduate school. Right. Yeah, Presumably yeah. because you learned more about the different positions. You, you thought about it and, and things started resonating yeah. in a different, yeah. different way. And then there is a third uh, issue. Let's not forget. Uh, if you look at the history of philosophy... Uh, and you flatten it, you, you know, to sort of contemporary, you know, you pick up a, 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 a textbook uh, in introductory course in philosophy. Now, they, they all present it as if they uh, essentially had always uh, existed, but they didn't. You know, utilitarianism did not exist until, you know, a century and a half ago. I mean, there were... As a, theme, things, as, an, as a formal account, but certainly correct. utilitarian considerations oh, sure. are all over ancient Greek philosophy, right? Sure. Yeah. But as a formal account, yeah. as a formal... Uh, you know, way of thinking within within sort of ethics, it was not there, and even Kantian deontology was right. not there until yeah, absolutely, yeah, 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 and so on and so forth. And even if you want to go back to virtue ethics, which has a much longer history, there are different kinds of virtue ethics. Some of which were not there initially, you know, very early on, and some of which are very recent. I mean, if you go to Philippa Foot uh, right. uh, type of account for virtue ethics, that's very recent. That's a few decades uh, yeah. old. Right? So you always have to think about the fact that just because you're looking at a landscape with, let's say, three or four or five different peaks at the moment, that doesn't mean there are no other peaks out there. There may be, and somebody may actually curve them out in the future and therefore change the entire landscape because all of a sudden you're going to pull people into this new area that people hadn't, hadn't thought about before. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is this really, this is great stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I... The pro your project and just reading it and participating in the discussion, it got me so thinking about it that I wrote my own uh, sort of, t I did, did my own essay on what I think of philosophy and progress. And so many of the things you're saying now, I'm mean, just... Patrick Agora, right? Yeah, and I'm wondering, you know, I actually said that I thought philosophers were a lot more like artists than like scientists. And I'll tell you why, because some of the stuff you've just been saying now really makes me wonder whether... We're saying the same thing in very different, um, but using using different languages, so to speak. Um, it's possible. You know, I I look at all these facts together. So one, there are very smart people in every single respectable part of the philosophical map. Um, number two, um, these theories are uh, they're indeterminate in the sense that no further amount of facts or reasons are going to um, um, pick one over the other. Um, and I look further at the fact that um, um, different people can find a set of reasons completely compelling or completely uncompelling. And what, th what I conclude looking at all that is that, well, what that shows is that philosophy, the, 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 po the position a person holds is as much an expression of their own temperament yeah. as, it is, as it is a response to reasons and evidence. In other words, if, it, if we held the philosophical views that we hold simply because of the reasons and evidence, right. things wouldn't look like this, right? And so that's why I wonder whether, um, you know, that, and that's why, you know, when you said to me why my position changed over time, you said, well, you know, you looked at the, the reasons and the arguments, but I'll give you the bigger reason. I changed. I that's got right. older. Sure. I, got, sure. I got older. I got older. You know, and, and so my whole way of thinking changed. 
Sure. And so do you think that there's – and I think that this is very different from uh, math, uh, very different from, from science, but I also think it's very different from logic and mathematics. Yeah. Um, 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 this is more like some, why somebody decides to work in the cubist ma ma modality rather than a realist one, right? Yes. But – so, so I actually think you got a lot right there. But I'm going to take a partial exception to it. So here it is. So last time, I think we did talk about the fact that initially in the um, project for the book, you were going to have a section on arts. Yeah, right. Yeah, I yeah. wasn't limiting only to comparisons between philosophy and natural science, math and logic, but I was also going to go into sort of the arts or music or something like that, right? Because I do think that in some sense, not too removed from the one that I'm putting forth for philosophy. Also, the arts and music, you know, the visual arts and music and so on, also make sense in that in, in the specific um, conception that they, over time, artists and musicians explore different possibilities. But they create worlds almost, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. And so, you know, we talked about, I think we talked about jazz. Yeah. And if you look at the history of jazz throughout the late 19th century and early 21st century, it went through a series of, 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 Almost predictable steps. Of course, after the fact, everybody can predict any, anything. Yeah, right. um, but but you know, it started out as very it's very um, structured. Even though it's we associate jazz to sort of improvisation, yes. But it was an improvisation with very good, very 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 clear structure. You recognize that it's jazz. The New Orleans jazz, for instance, it's it's typical. Right. Thing. You know, it's got a certain beat. It's got a certain kind of way of doing it. Uh, certain rules, and then it moved into. Uh, you know, it, it sort of detached pro progressively itself from that very structured way of doing things. It exploded in a different uh, uh, number of ways throughout the 1930s and 40s and 50s into the 60s. And then it became more and more of a free form, basically. Yeah. And then you get to almost a tonal music or, or very free uh, yeah. jazz. And well, at that point, where else are you going to go and still call it jazz? Uh, well, now you're going to get, you know, in the, the late 90s or early 2000s, you actually have now people that do mix. Revis mix revisiting and re they revisit. recombining and re... And that to me indicates that at least at the moment, I mean, I don't want to make, you know, first of all, I don't want to make enemies of my mu musicians' friends, but also it's, it, you know, it's hard to make a prediction of where a particular form of art is going. But at the moment, at least in this particular historical moment, the very fact that they're revisiting and mixing different things indicates to me that they sort of exhausted a, a, a particular space. type of landscape. Yeah, yeah, space, yeah. Kind of scape, yeah. Space. And the same goes for the visual arts. I mean, you know, at some point, uh, we had to get to the kind of minimalist yeah. art that it's just yeah. like, you know, canvas, yeah. white canvas number three, yeah. white canvas number four. Yeah. yeah, but once you get there, where else are you going to go? Well, Arthur Danto, famously, his entire, I mean, um, Arthur Danto's theory of art is based on this almost Hegelian notion that art history comes to an end when right. the space gets exhausted, when that conceptual right. space, and you know that that's going to happen when it starts to become self-reflexive, when it starts to Correct. become about itself to a certain extent, Correct. Um, now, as all postmodern arts are, right? Correct. Um, um, so I agree with you up to this point, and now I'm going to make the distinction, however, between so the arts on the one end and philosophy on the other end, which is... I think if if this is not a qualitative distinction, at the very least, it's a large quantitative distinction of some sort. And the distinction is this. Uh, you were talking about temperament, you know, how certain things, you know, resonate with you at a certain age or, or resonate with certain people, but right. rather than others because they're the temperaments. Yes, that is definitely the case for music and the visual arts and things like that, right? I mean, that's the whole point. Right. right? But you don't think right? that's true in philosophy. No, and the reason so you think is, that well, the reason someone's a deontologist as opposed to a utilitarian is because they really found those reasons so much more compelling than the other reasons. But then the question is, why did they find those reasons? Because there's another guy who finds the opposite set of reasons more compelling. That's the reason why he's a utilitarian and not deontologist. And what that sounds to me like is taste resulting from temperament, right? Not going where the arguments point, but which but arguments I you find the most compelling. Right, but I don't think those two things are, are, are mutually exclusive. Okay, no, I'm not going to say, right? So I'm not going to say that uh, certain people uh, feel more confident or more compelled by certain philosophical accounts, in part at least because of their personal histories and, 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 and personalities and so on. So I, I'm sure that that is the case. But that's true, by the way, also in science. Is it really? Oh, yes. 
There are in every But there's such a thing in science as decisive evidence, right? I mean, there's such a thing in science of conclusive evidence, right? There point, isn't in philosophy. At some point, but it's very well known in science, for instance, both in biology and, and in physics, that there are uh, temperaments that make a scientist more conservative, let's say, hmm. or more, you know, wild, of much of a wild card. So there are some scientists who are oft, always after the next crazy idea, and occasionally they get it right. Hmm. And then there are some scientists who, on the other hand, tend to be very conservative and say, no, 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 I'm not going to go there. That's a matter of temperament. I don't think there is a, a rhyme or reason uh, to it other than temperament. But it's not only temperament because in the sciences, because at some point it will turn out that, you know, your, that theory is, in fact likely or more likely to be correct than another. And the reason I think philosophy is also different from the arts is because in the arts, I think it's entirely or almost entirely a question of temperament and, and you know, personal uh, taste and so on and so forth. In philosophy, there is also a important role of reason. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I'm not denying that the arguments, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do yeah. change your mind after you reason on certain things, right? So in philosophy, and also, of course, philosophy, unlike art, does deal with uh, matters of very direct concern in, in, to human beings, especially if we're talking about ethics, right? I mean, it, it doesn't make much of a difference if I prefer jazz and my brother prefers, you know, classical music. It's right. like, whatever, right? I go to certain concerts, he goes to other concerts, doesn't matter. But it, but it does make a difference. If, I, if we think differently about a particular ethical issue, because then we're going to vote, for instance, uh, politically in a, in a different manner, and that's going to have an impact on, on society. You're saying artistic positions, if you're going to call them that, because they don't really have accounts, or, uh, are, are gratuitous to a certain degree, you think, um, um, in, in a way that philosophy is more uh, impactful. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Although, although in philosophy, there's an awful lot of positions that are gratuitous. I mean, as you and I have discussed in a number of different things, it is empirically neutral whether you're a realist or an anti-realist, right? Um, yeah. um, um, a, a metaphysical realist or an anti I mean, there's a lot of philosophical positions that right. are not impact, that are gratuitous in that way also. Um, 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 but those are, again, in, in some part, I'm sure those are a matter of uh, personality. Yeah, yeah. But there's also arguments, again. And, you know, you can, so, so I, for instance, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy you, you picked up on the realist ante realist debate, especially in philosophy of science. So when I started reading, you know, when I started out as a philosopher of science, uh, but, but coming from the sciences, I was most definitely a realist. I mean, when I read Van Frassen, when I read, you know, the modern anti-realist account, I said, what the hell are these people talking about? But then I went through a period when I said, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. Actually, they have some interesting arguments there. Yeah. <laughs> And so I've come, I haven't, I've not become an anti-realist, but I've come much more, become much more careful about my realism, right? So I would hope right now, now after, you know, 10 years or so, 15 years of thinking about this stuff, I'm a much less naive realist, precisely because I'm aware of the anti-realist arguments and I respect them intellectually. So there's another account you could give of what the value is of having these multiple accounts that are to yeah. some degree incommensurable and to some degree don't you can't sell them on them is that one's practice one's views in practice become more sophisticated more subtle more more attentive to nuance um, um, and, and the like um, so would you say then I mean we're talking on so many of our conversations often start with me introducing what I think are category differences and you and you main, you maintaining that they're really spectrum differences. Right. Would you want to say that if we're not talking about the person the persons, the people, philosophers, scientists, artists, that uh, and, the, and and the activity that philosophy is more than science a kind of performance, right? Um, yes. because it does express the temperament because yes. the reason, because there isn't anything in philosophy like the like decisive evidence in science, right? Although you say it's real, it's not that common in science either. But there no. is such a thing as decisive evidence, where they're just positions nobody's going to hold anymore because you know we have these objective facts. Um, would you say that there is more of a of a that, that the philosophy is more of an expression of the self, the person, than science is, but less so than than literature or painting? Yes, I think I think so. And then, then the interesting question, if you want to put it that way, is 
What about things like mathematics and logic? Right. That's the, that's where right. it strikes me. There's a disanalogy because are those ex performative in the way that that no, philosophy actually, is? No, actually, I think they're even less performative than science. And and the reason for that is because in science, uh, you know, people are aware that there's going to be hopefully there's going to be an empirical way to settle the matter, but it, that way may be a long way. And, and it may be ambiguous. It may be a vanishing point, right? I mean, stuff like the it ultimate may, That's right. Physics. It may be a vanishing point, and it may be ambiguous even, even when it comes. You know, very often in, in the course mm. of scientific debates, evidence, some evidence does come in, but it's not quite, you know, it doesn't settle things quite that much. And so people keep, keep, can keep going for decades, sometimes more, uh, sort right. of holding to different positions. But in mathematics or in logic, once you've shown something, I mean, it's true that some mathematical conjectures have taken centuries to be settled. But it seems to me that once they're settled, that's it. There's, there's really no going back. You know, once you, you know, mathematics in that sense is much more cumulative. Although even there, as I point out in the book, there are actually examples, uh, there are actually exceptions. There are situations, there are, there are occasionally situations where mathematicians had apparently settled on a particular answer and then they sort of reverse themselves. But it seems that if you look at the history of mathematics as opposed to the history of science, there are many, many fewer reversals. Once something is settled, it, 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 you get there, that's it, done. Uh, there's, you don't there's go no back. Way. Yeah, you, you don't go back. And so if you cannot go back because it's in fact completely untenable on logical grounds to go back, then it seems to me that personality matters even less. So let me ask you that. I mean, I, I, and this may be unfair to ask because it's a, off, it's a, it's a curveball from the, but on the one hand, you want to say philosophy progresses more like logic and mathematics than like science, although it's a, bl it's a little blurry. Um, but on the other hand, you want to say that the activity of doing philosophy yeah. is somewhere between science and the arts yes. and logic and mathematics is actually the farthest away. Yeah, this may be totally unfair, but how how is there any way to reconcile those? Oh, things? I, th I think there is. No, I think so? it's a fair, I think it's a fair question, but I think there is. So imagine what you just described uh, is a situation where you have a landscape that has two axes, right? It's got two dimensions. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, on one dimension, if you just project, so on on this plane that I'm identifying, you have philosophy, science, mathematics, logic, the arts, and a bunch of other stuff, right? And so it may be that if you just do a projection on one axis, the axis of, let's say, personality and creativity and whatever it is, then philosophy comes closer to the arts than to mathematics. But if you project on the other axis, uh, where mm. on the, 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 the criterion is, you know, the, the, how you make progress and so on and so forth, then now on that axis, philosophy is actually further from the arts and much closer to mathematics and logic. If you put them both together, then you get a more complex landscape okay. where philosophy is going to be somewhere in the middle because it's got actually the proximity depends on two different uh, uh, axes that are orthogonal to each other. Okay. So yeah, I think, I think you're right in your observation, but I don't think that's a problem necessarily. And you know, probably if the two of us just kept going for another hour, we, we might find a third axis that separates things even in a different way. Um, this is a very well-known uh, uh, situation. You know, statisticians actually have uh, sophisticated ways of handling these multidimensional problems, right? If you can quantify them. I mean, obviously, we're not going to... Yeah, no, but that's really interesting. You're right. Statistics as a whole, there's a whole area that's devoted to precisely these sorts of uh, yeah. multi-classifiable sort of... Right. That's and really so it very well be that on, on one particular axis, on one particular dimension things turn out in a certain way, on a different dimension turn out in a different way, and actually what you're saying, uh, actually what you suggest, uh, may even help explain why people are so confused when they think about these different fields, because, and you know, oh, but this is closer to that one, that one is closer. Well, that's because you're looking at the multidimensional aspect all at once, right, right. and you're confusing different variables and different right. factors that actually sort things differently. And that's, I mean, in philosophy is such a rich, broad landscape, that's right. why you look at it with one eye open and it looks a hell of a lot like arts. I mean, look at Montaigne's essays, right? And then yeah, you, you exactly. close your other eye and it looks like freaking logic or math or something. I mean, look at, look at you know, papers by, by Hempel or by, or by or, you know, because right. of the, the, the landscape. So we're at an hour. There was, there was one more thing I wanted to push you on um, or press you on that I hope will clarify 
um, your kind of philosophy and progress and where it fits in this map. Um, and probably will again re re reveal the sort of difference between us. I think it's worth noting, by the way, I came to philosophy from the humanities. Yeah, I came to philosophy right. from, from literature. Yeah. You came yeah. to philosophy from sciences. Yeah. And, and sorry, before you go ahead, actually, yeah. that's a good observation, right? So philosophy typically is housed in the humanities department, yeah. right? Um, but if your experience is like mine, I mean, now I've been in you know, three different philosophy departments. Uh, and, and of course, I know people at a bunch of other places. That classification does not sit well. It's, it's uncomfortable, yeah. It's uncomfortable, right? Because it, precisely because there are some aspects of philosophy that are much closer to, let's say, literature or even the arts. Uh, and then there are other aspects of philosophy that are actually much closer to mathematics, logic, or, or even the empirical sciences. Yeah. Or the, certainly the social sciences, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, when I teach a course in epistemology, uh, there is a guy across the campus in the psychology department that teaches a course about, on, 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 or critical thinking, let's say. There is psychology courses on critical thinking. They draw on philosophy and on, you know, the concepts, concepts like fallacies and so on and so forth. And I draw on their empirical research uh, about cognitive biases and things yeah. like that, right? But, but if you go to a colleague of mine who does aesthetics, let's say, um, that's a whole different thing. Yeah. It's, you know, actually, it's, critical thinking sometimes is taught in English departments. I've seen it. I've seen yeah. it taught in English departments um, and in communications departments. I mean, you're right. I mean, I mean, you know, I, I wonder if that's part of philosophy's misfortunes in the in the academy is that um, in the day to day we want to, we want very clean boxes to put things in. Uh, yeah. The bureaucrats do right. Yeah. Uh, the administrators do, and and the philosophy is just not that kind of animal. I mean, it just doesn't. No, that's that's true. On the other hand, that is exactly what attracted me to philosophy. Yeah, it's precisely yeah. this this idea that it's it's interconnected. It's a web that it's everywhere. It goes everywhere. Yeah. you can go in all sorts of different directions. Yeah, yeah. But I, sorry, so you were you were. No, the last so the last thing I was going to push, I was going to press you on a little bit is, um, and and it'll probably again reveal that this 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 difference between uh, me seeing it as more like art, like arts and you seeing it as as more uh, mixed than that, um, and that is to. Whenever I hear the word progress, I mean, one of the things that it immediately connotes is betterment, right? So if something is, I mean, look, there's a, there's a completely non-normative sense of progress, which simply means uh, that there's a next, next part or a next stage, right? right. Um, um, but the interesting sense of progress is normative. Um, and and yeah. thus it means, it means that in some sense the thing has gotten better, right? And um, one of the reasons that I, I, was, I found myself inclined to think of philosophy as more like the arts is that I think both philo neither philosophy nor the arts have gotten better in that way. Um, and that it's really odd to say that they've gotten better. So both in philosophy and in the arts, you have far larger number of tools than we used to have. In other words, the number of tools is greater. Um, even the number, as you say, of positions on the map is greater. Um, but it would be very odd to say that philosophy today is better than philosophy in the Enlightenment or philosophy in the ancient Greek world, um, and, I, and I'm going to I'm going to give a reason. I'm going to give an example of why I think that's the case. Just as it would be, you know, you were correct. You said in one of the, our dialogues, I think the last one, you said, you know, there's been progress in the arts in the sense that you know in the Renaissance they developed visual perspective, right? Now that's certainly progress, but it would be very strange to say that Italian Renaissance art is better than medieval art um, because it's not. Or even that Italian Renaissance art, which employs the visual perspective, is better than Flemish Renaissance art, which does not, right? right. Um, and so, um, so let me give an example in philosophy of why I think you really can't say that philosophy is better today than it was in previous eras. Um, okay. So, so let's take, take ethics, your favorite example, right? Um, or, or a very illustrative example. Um, it would be very strange to say that utilitarianism and Kantianism are an advance in the sense of represent better moral, moral theorizing than the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. Um, um, and in fact, in my mind, they're worse. Right, and, and uh, you know, I, you could point out and say, look, you know, um, some of the best moral philosophers of the contemporary era are virtue ethicists, and I was thinking in particular Alistair McIntyre, right? who not only is he a virtue ethicist, but he argues that the kind of moral philosophizing that was done in the Enlightenment was actually worse than the kind of moral philosophy that was done in ancient Greece. 
Um, he has a very compelling argument in the book After Virtue. It piggybacks on an earlier argument that Elizabeth Anscombe, also not a stupid person, um, right. um, wrote in a, a very famous paper called Modern Moral Philosophy, which, which, which McIntyre basically takes the core idea of and expands. Um, and so it's not clear to me, this is why the impression I have is a philosophy going in sort of circles that sort of wander around a map. But so... A, do you agree that progress implies betterment? Yeah. And two, if it does, how can philosophy have progressed in any sense, even the sense you suggested, if at the end of the day it makes no sense to say Kripke is better than Aristotle, right? Yeah. Quine is better than Hume, and philosophy yeah. today is better than philosophy in previous right. years? You know, I, I think that that is an excellent way to put it. And I'm going to answer yes into the first question, meaning that, uh, yes, to me, an interesting sense of progress has to improve, include betterment uh, and, and not just a simple unfolding of different possibilities, right. because otherwise you have an occupation of, of space, but not but not but no progress in, in that sense. But I'm going to disagree that. Well, I'm going to agree with you on the specifics, but disagree on the general. That is, yes, I do, disagree, I do agree with you that it doesn't make any sense to say that utilitarianism is better than virtue. It's progress, meaning in the sense better of... Better than Aristotle. That's right. 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 Yeah. right. I, don't, I don't think makes, that makes any sense. And in fact, as you said, uh, one can make a reasonable argument that utilitarianism, utilitarianism is actually better, less, less of a good position in ethics than, than virtue ethics. Um, but I think that the field of ethics has made progress. So if you if you if you want meta ethics has made a progress, has made progress because it now has more than one uh, reasonably well framed, coherent and well worked out uh, account of ethics. Uh, just like in epistemology, uh, especially after Gettier, and you know maybe we'll get there the, ne the next time. But after Gettier. You know, I'm not so sure. In fact, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't make any sense to say that this particular response to the Gaetje is definitely better or uh, progress than in com compared to another one. But the fact that now we have multiple interesting, useful, coherent, well worked out ways of thinking about knowledge, I think that is progress. So in ethics, I don't think utilitarianism is better than virtue ethics or, 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 or Kantian deontology, but I think the fact that we do have three, arguably four or five, major accounts of how to think about ethics, that means that ethics as a field has made progress. Okay, so you would want to say contemporary philosophy is better than philosophy as it was in the Enlightenment or in the, because... Okay, so but then it sounds to me like, but not, but wait, but wait, not because a single, an individual position. So, so here's the difference with science, right? We can say that physics today is better than physics in in Newton's time, right? right? <laughs> or, 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 or biology today is better than biology in Darwin. We can't time. say that the same way about philosophy. No, you cannot. But the distinction there is that we, again, we need to get out of these really compelling. Uh, and I think science imposed, yeah. you know, this, this comes from the model of science, uh, the science imposed idea that making progress means proceeding in, in the direction of one particular goal. You know, you're getting Newtonian mechanics is better than Aristotelian physics. You know, general relativity is better than Newtonian mechanics. And so it's this, this linear progression of things. Uh, philosophy makes progress by expanding the number of viable accounts, not by replacing one by the other. So if you're telling me, well, should utilitarianism replace Kantian deontology? No, it shouldn't. But if you're asking me, well, is ethics as a field better off? Because now we have utilitarianism, Kantian deontology. Right, 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 right. right. Say yes. Okay, yes. So, so it does sound to me like you're saying that um, – because of the role, because of the peculiar value that philosophical accounts have for us, the actually non-normative sense of progress in philosophy is becomes normative in the sense that it is better simply to have more, right? Yes, because of right. what they do. That's Each right. one gives you a new perspective from which to look at something. And you could say the same thing about the arts. Look, you'd be crazy to say that painting today is better than painting in the, in the, in the Flemish Renaissance, right? But sure. if you're a painter, 
you're in a better position today than someone was then because you have a hell of a lot more examples and right. types uh, to work palette, a pa board of palettes to work from. So in a sense, you really want to say, actually, the purely descriptive notion of progress in some cases can be a normative notion, right? It sometimes right. it is better to simply have more of something. That's right. right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You just get away from this idea that in order to count as progress, one thing has to replace the other. That's the science model. But look, it, that model doesn't even apply in logic. So right. in the chapter on logic, which we have already in part discussed, I actually go and explain how uh, beginning toward the end of the 19th century and then certainly into the 20th century, we don't have logic anymore. We have logics. We have plural logics, yeah. right? Yeah. So my textbook in graduate school was called Logics, plural. And that's be and, and you cannot, it makes no sense to say that, let's say, fuzzy logic is better than multimodal logic or whatever it but is. But it's better to have it. It's better to but have it. it's better it. to have them both. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Because they have different, they present you with different applications, different ways of thinking, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, yes, it's yeah. better. More is better, not just because it's, well, it's just more. Like, it's not like, oh, you got one more kind of cereal in the, in the, in the, in the breakfast aisle, right? Uh, no, it's not that kind of more is better. Yeah. It's, well, you can use it differently. You can apply it to different ways of, of you know, different problems. You have, as you put it a minute ago, I think that's a nice way to put it. You have a, a broader palette to work with for whatever the problem is that you want to work on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's, that's, really, that's really fascinating. And um, um, it, is, it does show a way in which you can, give, you can give a similar account of the way in which the arts are valuable to the way the philosophy is. Um, yes. And, but I do, I do think that it's crucial to your account of progress and for people to appreciate. Because remember what motivated all of this. Part of what motivated all this is your concern about the relative place of philosophy, not just in the academy, but in the, in the popular imagination. That's right. And it's, it's largely because because of the triumph of science and its mode, its model of inquiry, right? Um, it's almost like we're no longer able to understand other kinds of valuable activity, the ways in which activities can be valuable other than the way that science is. Yes. It really is crucial to appreciate your distinctive account of the way philosophy progresses to first understand what its distinctive value is to us, right? In what way is it valuable? Why is how, That's why I thought the question... Why is it good to have all these accounts, none of which are, is absolutely crucial? Because if you don't understand that, it just looks like there's more of it. Right? You missed the whole point. That's right. right. You missed the whole point. But it's interesting. So what, what you were just saying reminded me of the fact that uh, at a different scale, there is the same problem within science. So you just said, you know, the, the, the problem is that people think of philosophy, come to think of philosophy using the model of science. And so, of course, if, if science is your model of progress, then philosophy is definitely not making progress. Right. In that sense, but that's true also within the sciences. So I keep hearing just just the other day somebody uh, was making this argument with me that uh, you know I was here in Rome and was having a, a debate, a public debate actually on the nature of, of biology, biological theory, and somebody was saying was predictably a physicist was saying, well, you know, biology is behind physics because it's not sufficiently mathematized. You know, there's not enough mathematics. And my response really? was. Yes. Not just That's because a, it's about 500 years younger or 1,000 yeah. years younger. <laughs> right. right. Among other things. Or because, or because it deals with much more complicated Complex things. phenomena. Right. No. right. But my Go response on. was, look, not only it is a much younger discipline, not only it deals with things that are much more complicated, but there are certain things that are simply not amenable to mathematization, certainly not the kind of mathematization that physicists do, fundamental physicists do. And so to measure progress or, 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 or sophistication of a science by the account of fundamental physics is a mistake. Right. Because biology has made, actually, arguably, throughout the 20th century, biology has made much more progress than physics, than fundamental physics. Yes, has, yes. By a number of reasonable accounts of progress. Yeah. And yet that has come with comparatively little mathematization. That's because you cannot simply import the model of fundamental physics to science as a whole, just in the same way in which you cannot import the model of science as a whole to every other human activity and say, oh, unless it looks like science, it's not making progress. Right. Partly because there's no one way that science looks. Um, exactly. Would you also, I mean, if you were to write, you know, 
a Diderot encyclopedia size sort of treat, treatment of this sort of thing. I mean, would you want to distinguish subtle differences of types of progress within the sciences? In other words, would you want to say, look, you really can't talk about progress in physics and biology really the same way even? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think actually that book needs to be written at some point. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, but yes, it does. And in fact, that is one of the reasons I find uh, the famous paper that we keep talking about uh, by Jerry Fodor on, on the special sciences yeah. so compelling, right? Because that and also a lot of other stuff that has come out then more recently in philosophy of science by you know people like Nancy Cartwright and Ian Hacking and yeah, so on and so forth. Yeah. I do think, or John Dupre, I do think that there is a sense in which that using the word science as if it were one thing, one monolithic kind of activity is a mistake. It's a profound mistake. Now, the, the whole point of saying, you know, the, the, the whole idea of saying, oh, the social sciences are not scientific enough right. you know, because they're not like physics. Right. Well, they're not like physics for good reasons. Not because the people that, pra that practice those systems are weak-minded, right? right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're not idiots, right? right? They're smart people. And in fact, Max nice Weber was not stupid, right? <laughs> no. When we talked about it last time, I think at some point I mentioned that, that I have this colleague of mine who does work in, in the social sciences, he's interested in, in you know, the issue of colonialism. And he was very nicely explaining to one of my classes that, you know, yes, we call them social sciences because we try to do the sort of quantify, quantification approach that the, the, the natural sciences are famous for. But in fact, there is an inescapable component of human narrative. Yeah, yeah, that you cannot I agree with that, yes. Do that, right? You cannot do that. And so the social sciences, I don't think they are different from physics because they're not yet as, you know, like physics. Right. But eventually they'll get more like, it's, they can't right. be like that. They're not going to go yeah. there. Yeah. And that's a good thing. Yeah. Because they are a, a, a different animal. They work differently and they need to be appreciated, respected, and when necessary, of course, criticized on their own terms. Yeah. You know, let's just stop with this really idiotic thing that everything has to look like science otherwise it's worthless or everything and has to look science, like physics right, everything right. Like and if within science everything has to look like physics yeah. otherwise it's behind the term the, the time that's just not the case yeah and there's a lot of conversations i mean you know i, I don't need to tell you since you, you're, you're the poor guy who has to moderate all my uh <laughs> splenetic er, out, outbursts but but there is a kind of ver you see this conversation at Plato's footnote all the time where yes. people just hand wave towards science. So science yes. does this or science does that. And you're just like, what does that even mean? What they mean is physics does this and physics does but, that. But right? you know, one of, one of the <laughs> nice things now about um, having written this book and you know, ser serialized it on the blog. So the book, of course, is, in, is, is available at Plato's footnote. Yeah, but we're going to link to it, obviously. Yeah. yeah, and you don't have to look for, a, for every single chapter separately or subsection separately because there is a, a tag that actually unifies all of them, right? And so now, the, one of the nice things about having written that book is that periodically on my Twitter account, I have somebody who says, ha, philosophy, it doesn't make progress, unlike science. And now all I do is to respond with a link. <laughs> link to the... <laughs> Here, read the book, man, and then we'll talk. Unfortunately, it's a little more longer than 140 characters. Yeah. But, you, know. you know, I think this is the last thing I want to say that we will go. Um, I think, you know... So long as they're still going after philosophy and social sciences, these are relatively soft topics, soft targets. But right. I think if this hard physics crowd starts really going after biology, I think that that's where maybe, um, maybe this trend will finally break. Because biology okay. has had so much success, and when you, when you consider its extension into medicine, right? Yes. Has had such a, I mean, life transforming to the point to which you can mark periods of civilization on the basis of when my, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make the physicists look foolish if they start trying to press this attack. You can push it on a bunch of hippie sociologists and maybe score a few points. You're not going to do this with no. genetics no. and modern medicine and all of this sort of stuff, right? And th that's exactly because biology during the 20th century and, and now into the 21st century. the most century. successful science of the last century. It is. Yeah. It is. And you know what? Philosophers, but we can we can end if you if you will on this, on this note because philosophers actually became aware of this very early on. If you look, if, uh, I'm talking philosophy of science in particular. If you're looking at the very recent history of philosophy of science, 
throughout most of the 20th century, philosophy of science was essentially philosophy of physics. Yeah. Very little else. If you look now, it's almost exclusively philosophy of biology. There's, there is, of course, still a lot of philosophy of physics, but it tells you a lot. Yeah. yeah, it's completely outdone by the philosophy of biology, and there is nothing else, almost nothing else in the other sciences. So biology is, in fact, the current, currently dominant uh, discipline. And I think you can even measure that probably in grant money that comes, you know, especially, as you say, if you count... Because of medicine. Yeah, because yeah of medicine. if you include medicine, if you include the health sciences, then it's overwhelmingly... You know, yes, you can pay billions of dollars for a single particle accelerator, but right. you pay a lot more for all the biomedical right. sciences. And for good reason. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. you know, biology and organic chemistry, you put those two together. I mean, that's modern medicine, right? I mean, I mean, yeah. and so, well, Massimo, this is wonderful. Um, and I think maybe the last, the last one, since we didn't really do this, maybe we should take some time and space to talk through some really well-chosen examples of yours of where philosophy has made progress in the way you describe right. across maybe a, some, dis, some, some, some highly um, uh, identifiable areas, epistemology, ethics, politi political philosophy would be interesting. I don't know if you could do that right. one. Um, um, and, uh, and, and, and maybe philosophy of that. science. The other example is philosophy of science. Yeah. 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 All right, Massimo. Yeah. But that will be back in New York, I gather. Yes, I'll, yes, I'm almost done here. I'm going to go on a short vacation, as I mentioned, and That's then right. back to New York. Yep. That's right. Okay. Well, the next time I see you, it'll be uh, with that uh, Gotham cityscape behind you, or one of or, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And um, happy travels. Thank you. Enjoy your last few days with your family, and I'll see you soon. All right. All right. See you soon. Take care.